welcome for uh, and for coming out on this Ash Wednesday. Um, we thought that a good way to start would be for Michael to show some images, uh, and then we'll talk. Michael. Yeah. So my my thanks to this is for me. It's such a. Can you hear me? Okay. For me, it, it's such a special event, and I'm grateful to Kara and the studio school. I'm always happy to be back here uh, so soon after the last time, too, and, and very grateful to Levi for, for taking this on. Um, so we thought that it would be useful, important to begin with some images, and I really didn't know how to do that, because how in a few minutes just to blow through a number of images of an artist who made several hundred works, sculptures, and then there were all the paintings and drawings. So, uh, and do it in such a way that could be useful to people who know the work and people out there who don't know anything about David Smith at all. So what I, what I finally came up with is, <clears throat> Images where they have some, they're, they're relational images. So they're, they're images of Smith in relation to the landscape, in relation to other works, in relation to, to other people. And, and they make a point, I think, about the singularity of David Smith, the artist, and the reaction or the resistance to the notion of the singular in the work. And also a point, I think, about the um, the unrepeatability of the work and the resistance to duplication in the work that's really an essential uh, aspect of it. Okay, so, uh, and I must say too, going through these images myself, it's quite thrilling after all these years of thinking about David Smith to still find it so exciting to look at the images of his work so this is uh, probably the most um, reproduced image in his, in his lifetime. It's an image of his 1951 sculpture, Australia. Set in the landscape, obviously near <clears throat> in Bolton Landing, in the Adirondacks where he lived. Uh, it's his photograph and um, and the, yeah, the relation to the landscape is, is obvious, but the, the particular way in which he wants people to see the work in the landscape, through the landscape, and the way in which the sky, uh, the sky and the mountains actually become part of the work. This is the same image of Australia, and I put it alongside the, the image from the Museum of Modern Art, their photograph, the Mama owns the work, and um, I think you can see from the two images that there's the big difference between um, Smith's photograph and the photograph in the museum and the fact that the work would actually look so different <laughs> if you saw it in the museum. It's like two different works. This is two more images of Australia. The one on the left is, the, well, both of them are really what, what Smith himself called end views. And they make the point that uh, Ross and Krauss made many years ago, really in a central point, which is that when you move around the work, it's not so much you're, you're changing points of view, you're looking at, it, at a different work. And then finally, Australia, these two, these two photographs, again, which are Smith images, he took them himself, which suggest, uh, you know, his relationship to his sculpture and uh, a kind of performativity of the sculpture uh, and himself, and um, and the, the ways in which the his sculpture functioned for him in the landscape and beyond. So this is Jurassic Bird. This is 1945, and it's an uh, image that you know obviously came at the end of the war, and a lot of people were a lot of artists were thinking about evolution, and uh, you know where we came from and and where we are and. These are both Smith images, um, the one on the left and the one on the right. And those, those sort of vertical elements in the belly, Smith described them or connected them with, with slaves in the galley. And they also make me think of, uh, of factory and assembly line. And 
And so I think for him, you know, part of the idea is the, is the way in which sort of you know, different forms of slavery are, are embedded in the belly of, of this prehistoric fossil. There's another image of Jurassic Bird, uh, which Smith took, and this is outside his home, and, and again, clearly, you know, it looks like a somewhat different work. And here, in a, in a, in a pretty famous image, where he put Jurassic Bird on the table of a pretty important group of people who was visiting him in, the, in November 1952, uh, another fairly famous photograph. So from left to right, it's Lee Krasner, Jean Fries, who became Smith's second wife a year later in 1953, Jackson Pollock, Smith, I mean Smith, Jackson Pollock, no. Jackson Pollock, Smith, Clement Greenberg, and Helen Frankenthaler. This is Agricola I, uh, 1951, 1952. It was the work that began the Agricola series, which, uh, and that began the whole sort of spade of remarkable series that Smith set in motion after 1950. And the image on the right is his image of the work in the landscape, unfinished unpainted, and the image on the left is, is the, the work painted in the Herschel Museum uh, in Washington, which owns it. So here's an another double image. This is the letter, 1950, and uh, on the right is Smith's photograph of the work in the landscape, and on the left is a photograph taken by the Munson Proctor Art Institute in Utica, which which owns the work, and you know, I should say, I really kind of am glad to say I'm very attached to this work, and and if I had a choice of of David Smith's to own, and you know, the competition is pretty fierce here. I think this is this this is the work that that I would take. There there's something like a greeting at the top, which seems like it should be a greeting, dear such and such, but it really uh, the the sort of scribble is impossible to make out. And the signature on the bottom, it does begin with David. And then the, the letters after that, they're, they're not letters. It's, a, it's like the back of a fossil, like the back of a dinosaur that his name is attached to. And uh, all, these, all these letters are also images. And all these letters and images are also changing all the time. That's another sort of close-up of the of a couple of details of the work, which, you know, taken in the storage room of the Munson Project. So another sort of famous photograph, another image of Smith, sort of fabulous preacher creations. And these are, this is Tank Totem 4, Tank Totem 3. The Tank Totem series began in 1952, ended, or just ran out in 1960, and uh, this is on the dock at Bolton Landing where he photographed many works as he also photographed them in the hills. And the third work there is simply, it's a date, 7-29-53. This is just to give you some idea of, of, the, of the importance of color in Smith's work and the series, The, Z the Zigs. Um, it's the series that's most identified, most thought about in, in terms of color. And this is Zig 4 on the left and Zig 2 on the right. And Zig 4 is at Lincoln Center and where it always seems to me a bit like a caged animal. Um, this is Q by 1. And the image on the right is Dan Budnick's photograph of the, of the work in Smith's shop studio in Bolton Landing and where the work is pretty much done and you sort of get, you know, the idea from the expression on Smith's face, uh, you know, what it's involved in to actually do this work. And then um, in the Guggenheim, in the lobby of the Guggenheim for the Centennial Smith retrospective in 2006, where it was right in the middle of the lobby, and you also see uh, Australia in the background. It's another Smith image, and it was taken from a photograph, so it's not very good. But this is the, the Cubis, that's probably his most famous series, 1961 to 1965. 
and uh, again, you know, these sort of fantastic uh, animate things. This is Q by 17, 1963, and it's taken from uh, the, the porch or patio or terrace of his shop studio. And I wanted to show you a few of the Voltries. This, the, he made the Voltries in May and June, 1962. Uh, he was invited by the Spoleto Festival of Two Worlds to spend a month in, in Italy uh, and given an abandoned factory in Voltri outside of Genoa and given all the materials he wanted and workmen who would help him, and it was certainly the, the, the greatest moment of his life, and instead of making two or three works, which he was asked to do, he wound up making 27 in a month. And the curator, Giovanni Carandenti, basically, he not basically he took them all, and these are two of the works in the streets of Spoleto. Voltri 13 on the left, and Voltri 1 on the right. Um, 22 of the works wound up in the amphitheater, the old Roman amphitheater, and in uh, Spoleto. And two more images of that. And two more Voltries, that is Voltry 4 on the left, and then a photograph where you pick up Smith's Joy um, in that whole situation. And I wanted to show you, just run through a few images of Smith working. Uh, in his in his studio at home on the left, and then this is this is in the the abandoned factory in Voltry on the right. This too. This too. And this too. It's a photograph of Primo Piano One, um, 1963, and and uh, with. Smith's daughters, this is his photograph, Candida and Rebecca. <coughs> Beck Dida Day on the left, 1963, uh, the, the convex side of it is painted yellow. And then the, the photograph on the right of, there are actually three circles here, one, two, and three. This is in the National Gallery in Washington. And, um, you know, I photograph them as a kind of lens which is, yeah. And here are the circles one, two, three, and five, along with Zig four, in the snow, in the landscape, outside Smith's home in Bolton Landing. I wanted to show this sort of strange photograph, which Alexander Lieberman took uh, a week before Smith died in May 1965. Uh, Smith was on the Honda, red Honda trail bike that he'd recently bought. And uh, you see the circles. I don't quite know why they look so gigantic here, but they do. And then the other work directly behind him is un Untitled Candida. Again, one of the iconic Smith images taken by Dan Budnick in 1963. This is Smith overlooking the South field, Southfields. It was the only image Budnick told me that he asked Smith to uh, actually pose for. And finally, um, another bug dick photograph taken a couple of years after Smith's death, where you can see the, the rows of sculptures in the, in the north fields with the absence, with the empty plinths, where some of them were and, and by this point are gone. And you also see at the top of the screen the, the south field, which you were just looking at. There were 80 sculptures in all in the fields at the time that Smith died. Voila. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Michael, 20 years. I realized as I was reading the book that you uh, have been work you were working on the book almost the entire time I've known you. 20 plus years, um, but your engagement with, with Smith's work started long before that. Your first encounter with the work was in 1967. You were 24 years old in grad school in art history at Johns Hopkins, and you were writing the dissertation on Giacometti. Um, Smith had died less than two years earlier. 
And your first encounters were not with the monumental works, but as you say, with, quote, small sculptural tableau from the late 1930s and mid-1940s, miniature theaters with signs of domestic disillusion, potent dream objects, and hints of forbidden knowledge. Your biography of Smith is an extraordinary work full of fascinating detail and a chorus of voices, and I encourage everyone to read it. Uh, it's 800 pages long because it needs to be eight. It needed to be 800 pages long. Um, it's a biography of David Smith, yes, but it's also a history of art and artists, uh, primarily in New York City um, in the 20th century. And it's a history of art collecting. It's a political history. It's also a book about power in the art world and how that power shifted over the second half of the 20th century. The last sentence of your author's note at the beginning of the book is a kind of statement of intent or manifesto. It said, it is the unknowable totality of David Smith's art and life that I am after. The big question that I want to consider with you tonight is, what is the relation between an artist's work and their life. Um, of course, there are some people who would argue that there's no connection, uh, that um, one's life is one thing and one's work is something else, and the two are not necessarily related, um, that there's no direct causality or even a relation between the two. Um, I mean, that's a contention of a certain kind of formalism. Smith himself totally rejected that separation. Uh, you write that Smith, quote, was deeply interested in the connection between art and life, and he read biographies and biographical accounts of artists with gusto. Before he wrote about Julio Gonzalez's work, he wanted to know everything he could about the life of that artist, all kinds of intimate details. You write, quote, Smith's enemies were purists, categorizers, and reductivists, anyone who constricted human subjectivity. And obviously, you believe that there's a connection, a relation between the life and the art, or you wouldn't have spent 20 years of your own life writing David Smith's life. Kenneth Nolan said to you, no one has yet taken the measure of David. You set out in this book to take the measure of the man and the work. <coughs> You definitely probe every aspect of Smith's life, public and private, but you don't pass judgment on it. Some reviewers have complained about this, that you do not judge Smith. You judge the work, certainly, but not the man, or so they say. Um, you clearly revere the work, and I think it's fair to say you've come to revere the man as well. What is the distinction for you between judging and taking the measure of a man? Um, okay, the, the, the first part of it, the, um, the relationship between the art and the life to kind of begin to get into it and Smith's own use of biography. He, uh, he, he dated many of the works in such a way that can lead you to believe that, that there's almost a kind of, that the work is almost a kind of diary, that there's something diaristic about it. He named works after people, he named plenty of works after Becca and Dita, Ken Nolan, uh, Rosati. There, there are certainly hints in the titles of, of elements of events in his life. He, he, he mentioned his, his life in a number of essays and talks. But then there's the, the way the work actually relates to, I mean, if, if the work draws you in and indicates that, yes, there's a kind of ground in the life to actually make an extension from that information into the work is very difficult and almost Im impossible. There, is, there are almost no one-to-one -one correspondences between events 
in the life, I mean events in the life and, and the work. You can't go from the work to, you can't interpret a work in terms of what was going on in his, in his life. And there's a way, so there's a way that the, 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 the work is grounded in biography but is always going beyond biography so that the you know, explanation of, of the work in terms of the life becomes impossible. Hmm. So that there's, the work is always becoming something bigger. Um, and you know, in, this, in terms of this resisting explanation, of that hatred of explanation, which he, like many artists have, the question of, of, of judgment, I mean, it's an odd word, I'm, and I don't know to what degree I'd be comfortable using it. I think that I'm certainly comfortable with the work using a kind of critical lexicon, like it's very clear if you look at these slides even that, that Australia is a, is a central work and it's a work you can't take out of the, work, the body as a whole without something fundamentally collapsing. And um, so that there, there are ways of evaluating the work, there are ways of talking about what this work has to offer in terms of experience, which is what I'm always looking for in relation to other works. Uh, so like a, a, critical, a critical vocabulary, critical terms in terms of, you know, talking about the work is, is fine for me. Jud you know, judging the life, it, it, it's something I never thought of, and, and it's probably something that I would, that I would never do. Um, I, I pro you know, think about Smith maybe almost the way we think about friends, or the way th friends think about us, which is that there can be, there are many aspects to us, and there are some mm -hmm. aspects that may shock people and disturb people even to the point where you have to pull back and you have to really think about it in order, in order to figure out how this relationship is gonna go on, but they're friends and eventually some kind of larger picture emerges and then even the difficult points become part of a, part of a totality. So, you know, what I'm looking at, what I'm interested in is, is the whole thing and, and the way these parts put together and the idea of judgment, like it's a word that stops conversation for me and, and I feel like, you know, my relationship to David Smith is still so open. So it's, the, it's really the, the, the whole picture and in the end, the, the different pieces of it wind up, you know, forming some kind of um, idea in, of, of the whole in my mind. But I feel like judgment is, it's just, you know, I have a little bit of a reaction to it because it, again, it just seems to stop conversation and it seems to place me in a, in a position in, in, with regard to the material that like above it or superior to it and, and at no point did I feel, do I feel superior to David Smith, at no point do I feel morally superior to David Smith. I mean, obviously, you you took this on this biography on because you think that you thought that David Smith was the most important sculptor of the 20th century and that he was one of the greatest artists of all time. Um, but you also think that life and art represents something about America uh, that it's important for us to talk about now. At one point in the book, you quote from Fairfield Porter who you say saw identity as a big American theme, and that uh, the particular to interest Smith more than anything else, wrote Porter, is his own identity. The real issue is the identity of the artist. This is in 1957. And he's right. Uh, Smith talked constantly about identity. He wrote about it. He mentioned it over and over again, uh, how it was all about the artist's identity. Um, and you say, the sculptures, in his sculptures, identity is fluid and unknowable, but in his life, identity is a, is a different thing. Um, I, I was struck by, again, it's, it's certain, you say after 1950, he started using this word and he used it over and over and over again. And the way he's using it, uh, I think, is almost directly opposite from the way it's used now. Um, because for him, identity meant 
individual, the individual, um, individualism and what was particular to that person. Um, and the way it's used now is more actually uh, uh, true to its root meaning, which is sameness. I mean, being identical is being the same. Um, and I wonder how you think about that, uh, how he used the term. I mean, he again, he used it so many times that it, it became, it, he did this with a number of words. Uh, the other day I was, when I was talking to you, it, he almost uses words like a philosopher, to, like a phenomenologist would. I mean, he takes a word and he puts it in all these different situations and tries it out. Um, but do you think it's opposite? Um, I mean, how, do, how does Smith's idea of identity relate to what, how it's used now? I think it's the, the question of identity. It, it's, it's really underexplored in Smith's work, <clears throat> and it's a big subject and a really essential one. And as you say, I mean, he, he starts to use it around 1951, I believe, and then it becomes part of his vocabulary over the next seven or eight years. And he uses it in, there are odd structures to it, too, like once I had identity, or once, you know. So, uh, like, it's a familiar word, and it's a word that, it's a word that kind of runs, runs deep in American culture. I do think there's a Whitman-esque aspect of it. But, I, but to actually figure out what Smith meant by that word, um, I don't think we are close to doing it yet. Mm. I, mm. I think, um, on the one hand, it's something that suggests, you know, biography. So we, you can start with, he was born in, you know, Decatur, Indiana, and he had relatives who were pioneers, and, um, and he wound up in a, working in a steel factory, so, and steel became Essential. It was his. It was his material, and steel itself had a double identity for him. It was both con constructive and destructive, and he he talked about that identity. So that the, there's the there's the welder. There's the there there's the man of steel. Um, you know, there's the movement through the WPA and the and the support of other artists. So I I think that if one can deal with it biographically. Uh, but you only get so far with it, and uh, and then again, you know, it seems like there's it seems familiar, and then it and it kind of, you know, blows open, and uh, I I have and and I think you know the the kind of point you make about the way identity functioned for him in the, in the work and the way it could kind of mess up his life is like an interesting point. But anyway, I'm just gonna read this. Uh, this was part of, this was something he, he said at a symposium at the Museum of Modern Art in 1952, and it was, uh, the subject of the talk was the sculpture and his problems. And yeah, I mean, just in terms of the biography too, he talks about the importance in, in a letter in 1936 of, of, um, of deciding at that point that he was a sculptor. And he didn't have a split identity, which at that point between painting and sculpture. So the fact that sculpture itself could become an, an um, umbrella term in which like through whatever that word meant to him, that became the way in which he worked with everything, and, and that term itself is so wide open. Okay. So he's talking about the color black. Um, he said, when you ask the question to black, is it white, is it day or night, good or evil, positive or negative, is it life or death, is it the superficial scientific explanation about the absence of light, is it a solid wall or is it space, is it paint, a man, a father? Or does it come out blank, having been censored out by some known, unknown or unrecognizable association? There's no one answer. Black is no one thing. The answer depends upon impression. The importance of what black means depends upon your conviction and your artistic projection of black. 
depends upon your poetic vision, your mythopoetic view, your myth of black. And to the creative mind, the dream and myth of black is more the truth of black than the scientific theory or the dictionary explanation or the philosopher's account of black. Black is an article of vision defined translation and semantics. Now what he did with black, he also did with the color white. He also did with apples. He also did with um, pears. In other words, that everything is a, is a multitude and, uh, and um, everything kind of you know, ripples out and, uh, and the, it depends a, a lot on you know, its subjectivity, on, on everything else. So the identity, he also wanted a, an identity that was itself constantly changing. And, and there's a tremendous mutability to the work and there's a, there's a mutability to the man. So the identity, the notion of identity, which suggests something fixed um, and something that doesn't move, it's the opposite. So with him, so he wanted a kind of structure where there would be a conceptual framework that was consistent and included his own history, yet within that, continue to open up uh, and continue to be always beginning. I, I think if you look at he wrote three, three prose poems for a catalog in 1944, show in 1947 at Marion Willard. And in it, you, in, in Sculpture Is, you get references to very cryptic but um, abbreviated references to his life in the midst of all sorts of esoteric mm -hmm. References to myths, uh, to myths, to histories down through time, and it, it, you know, it's it's a, it's a suggestion of the kind of open-endedness that that he wanted, that he saw in terms of uh, himself, and um, and what he wanted, what he wanted art to be. So. Um, you know, this identity, and it's also, I think, connected to the way he viewed the unconscious, uh, which was so important to him coming out of surrealism. So if you can, and I, if you can establish a kind of structure, but you get the, you can work with the unconscious in such a way that you're actually moving from yourself outward, like in the unconscious, the whole world exists, all of time exists. So if he could find a certain kind of way of working that this, I, this, this identity would keep expanding and, and keep moving out. So um, at the same time, he was, he, was, I, he was very conscious of his own public image. I mean, he had, he had a big public image, uh, a lot of a lot of work went into making that image, not necessarily by him, but by other people. I know he had a complicated relationship to it, but he was aware of it for sure. Um, there are so many voices in, in this book, um, and you uh, really respond to that responsibility you had to all these people. Um, to stitch together a social portrait of the artist. Um, how many interviews did you do all together when it was all said and done? I think there were about 100 formal interviews that were done with a tape recorder, and then the, the number of conversations were, you know, there, there, there are hundreds of those. And obviously you're picking and choosing uh, what to include and what not to include, and there were a number of people that you wanted to interview that you couldn't for whatever reason, yes? Not many, there, no. were, there were a few. And um, I, I mean, can whenever the people that knew Smith, all, when you, they talk about him, it's all, they always talk about his candor, what they appreciated uh, in him, and uh, as a person, and that applies to you as a person as well. Can, can candor leavened with compassion and and uh, discretion. I would. That's with you, mm -hmm. not so much with Smith. Smith didn't leaven the candor all that much. Um, 
But you had to make hard choices about what to, in this massive material, all these interviews and, and uh, letters and everything that, uh, all the detective work, um, there were, you had to decide what to include and what not to include. What, what guided you in the end? I mean, it's great to mention the interviews and to, to mention them in relation to I identity and, and the, the perception or experience of Smith because obviously you know people who knew him and they tell you, um, everybody tells you something and what they tell you is often very different. And David Smith was someone who people wanted to talk about. Like uh, he was someone, no one, no one was indifferent to, to David Smith. So, um, I mean, at the beginning, the, in terms of people, I I didn't get. I think the 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 most important would would be George Rickey. I'm sorry that you know by the time because Rickey he he brought him to the University of Indiana and Mississippi, and he's a, also a steel sculptor. And and uh, by the time I got to him, it was too late, and I would have liked to have spoken to Helen Frankenthaler as well. But uh, Helen was at a particular moment in her life, and I'm not sure that she would have spoken to me because I have a sense that her relationship with David Smith was so personal that she might want to keep it to herself or maybe that the, the, uh, the people that she would talk to about it would be, you know, John Elderfield or Karen Wilkin. People talk, spoke to her. But by and large, I got people. Uh, you know, I, I spoke with people I wanted to and, um, you know, and then I've had, you know, multiple, I mean, the importance of conversations with, um, with Becca and Peter Stevens and, you know, Ann Lauterbach and, you know, Fawn Krieger, friends like that. But every, everybody who sees the work will give you something different. And, and in that sense, the more people you speak to, the more the, more the material is going to open up. I do want to say that these were real interviews. I mean, they weren't, um, they were all done kind of at the beginning of the century. They were analog. Uh, they weren't email exchanges which have their use, but they were, they were all interviews where there was a certain kind of unfolding. Um, in person. In person. And uh, well, there were a few telephone, telephone interviews, you know, Bill Rubin being one, Grace Hardigan being another, but by and large they weren't. Mm -hmm. So, and, and they had their own time. So, um, you know, I, I went into them, it's a little bit like, you know, our teaching at, at, at Bard, where you, you go in a studio visit and, and, and you close the door and you don't know what's going to happen. You, <laughs> uh, you've got the work in front of you so that there's something basing the conversation, but where you wind up at the end is very different than, uh, is completely pr unpredictable often than, than where you started. But those, those interviews were very, very important to me. Uh, I, I, I know it's been said that anecdote is the, you know, is the, you, you know, is the core of, of biography, but I think that interviews are just as important. And without these interviews, there would be no book. Um, because there's, a, along with information, there's texture, there's contradiction. Uh, and people talked, you know, they really wanted to talk about this person uh, whom they cared about very, very deeply. So, uh, and I was very grateful for these interviews because for many years this was a very solitary project. You know, you, we, we live in a con contemporary art world and, um, and in a contemporary art world very often, uh, you know, there, people are interested in other things. And I, I taught in a sculpture department at, at Bard where I was quite lucky because the, the people who run the department are makers, you know, one of them being, one of them here. And, uh, and if you really make things, you kind of want, you're interested in David Smith and you want to talk about him. So, uh, but I, there, were, there, were, there were just sort of years where I felt, you know, I was disappearing into some kind of, you know, world that was off on my own and it was somewhat disconnected from the other worlds that I was part of. Mm. So these, these interviews really were uh, a lifeblood. And um, they are, I feel, you know, they became part of my life. And the, um, they were transcribed. When I got the transcription back, I was listened to them. 
um, in part because you need to, there are always mistakes that the transcriber makes, but also you just to hear them. The importance of hearing the voice. And then these voices got into my head. Um, and, you know, very often I'd, I'd take the tapes with me in, in, in the car and I would listen to them there. So, and, and I, I feel that there's a kind of trust. Uh, uh, you know, I, the, these people I interview, they're important to me and, I, and maybe in some ways I was important to them because it was a chance to talk about something that mattered. And I know three of the people, after I interviewed them, decided to write <laughs> like their own, their own texts on David Smith. So, uh, <coughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I, I feel though, you know, this, those interviews in a way kind of grounded everything and gave me a sense of Smith, the many sides of Smith, the physicality of Smith, the, the conflict that he could arouse in Smith. And uh, it, they brought me very close to the material. And, and gave me a, cl a closeness to it that I certainly wouldn't have had any other way. I mean, you and I have talked a lot about the, this book took so long, and it's written. It's not, there's no formula there. There's no uh, way that things are put together. It's written, and um, to sustain that, over this time, I mean, I, it makes sense to me that the, the interviews were like a tributary that grounded things and c kept bringing things back. But, I mean, many people, and certainly most artists, are massive contradictions. And that's certainly true of Smith. And uh, rather than shy away from those contradictions, I found as a reader that actually those contradictions became a, th a center, a theme of the whole thing. Um, and it became central to the narrative. The other thing that we, we have talked about is that there, there, as you wrote and put the whole thing together as a whole, um, there, there must have been narratives that were insistent that kept coming back, kept coming back, and eventually you had to deal with them somehow. Um, and uh, I guess, I mean, I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about that, how, do you, how you dealt with that over time. There's a lot that's not in the, I mean, the book was a lot bigger at one point. There's a lot that's not in here. You, you, had, you made choices. The narrative has to be, to be compelling, it has to be coherent. Um, but there must have been things that, that insisted themselves. Um, you, you write that you came to biography beca because you found it, in it a literary form that, quote, would best allow for approaching art from multiple sp perspectives while holding at the center the mysterious reciprocity between an artist's work and life. Considering the relation between an artist's life and work, you told me recently that the, the two are not commensurate and the two are ultimately irreconcilable. Uh, is, I, can't, I couldn't remember whether that was the word you used. I, I certainly think about reconcilability and irreconcilability. I, I don't think that they're, the, the two are irreconcilable, um, although I think the, you know, the, the work, the, the, the life can illuminate the work, but the work is always going beyond the life. Um, I mean, if the work is, is any good, and this work certainly is. Um, but I, I think, gosh, um, I wanted to, you know, maybe talk about the various aspects of that question, but <clears throat> the, um, I mean, it's a book, so it has to exist as a book. And, and it has to be, like, you, you're aware of the reader. And um, this question of, of, of where the reader is and how far you can go without losing the reader and, and you know, where that point is, because it's a long book and, and not everybody's going to be able to, is going to be willing to <clears throat> pay attention all the way through, like you're going to lose people from, but where is the point where you, you lose them and you can't get them back, you know? <laughs> so, and, and there are different, there are different kinds of, of writing in the book. Uh, 
And, and I do feel, I, you know, it's written in such a way that I hope that if people reach a, a point where, you know, they're bored or they kind of want to put it back, that there's something will always snap back in a, in a place. And there, I think the, the, the chapter structure is a big help because the chapters are uh, kind of worlds in themselves for me. And, and they're very different and they can begin and then, you know, they have their own logic and then the chapter ends and then something else can begin. They definitely that, all have beginnings and endings. <laughs> the, and those sentences are cut. <clears throat> um, so, you know, it can be maybe in some way like the, like the work in that you, there, there's a kind of multitude in them and, and some of them might flow easily into the ones that come after them, but some you know, might not, so that there's a chance for a certain rhythm. I mean, there are a lot of chapters, and I, I don't know how people feel about that, but I, I felt it gave me like an episodic way of writing it, and, and they're not all written the same way, and um, so that there are different forms of writing. In other words, there's, there are just ways within the writing of the book that the particular complexity of the person and even the differences within the person uh, you know, in his life and his work can, can breathe a little bit, I hope. And I, I wanted to say something else because we both like Janae. And um, the, the, the essay you wrote on Giacometti, the studio of, of Giacometti, of Alberto Giacometti, which is a, you know, a very famous piece of... I used to say <clears throat> that, that that was, to me, that's the best thing that's ever been written about an artist. And, I don't know whether anything has happened to change that. Well, we both feel really strongly about it, but I, what I wanted to say here about that essay is this essay is a little bit stylistic for me in that part of what makes it a great piece of writing is that you've got, uh, you've got a kind of portrait of Giacometti. You've got descriptions of Giacometti. You've got descriptions of the work. You've got interpretations of the work. Uh, you've got Giacometti talking, you've got Janae talking, you've got the city in the work, uh, you've got the studio in the work. So you, you have, and you have different forms of narrative in it. And I think part of what makes it, the text so alive to me is that you've got all of it. And uh, you've got these multiple ways of, of telling a story. And, and so it, it, it's a text that suggested to me what the kind of energy that might, I mean, you know, I'm not Janae, but the kind of energy that might exist in a, in, a, in a text if you have these different aspects to it. And also, really important, the, um, the, the, the way Janae writes gets around the subject problem for me, which is that, you know, the, the kind of hollowness of the eye and the fact that there, there is this multiplicity of writings within that essay um, gets around, you know, gives it a kind of vitality. There's straightforward narrative, and, and the problems that would come through with that don't have. And, and I do sort of want to say to it, after the first, the author's note and the introduction, mm -hmm. almost never use I in the mm. book, like the, it, I appears sort of in the middle of the book, if I remember right, three times, and I somehow feel now, I wonder, should I have, you know, let them, should I have taken them out completely? Mm. Um, so that, uh, and I, and you know, and we live in a time when I is, seems to have a certain stability about it. <laughs> and it's the I that gives the credibility to a text, and for me, it has more of a tendency to destabilize language. So mm. it's, it's just a way of, 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 of saying that I've thought a lot about r the writing of it and what could create a certain kind of credibility um, and vitality in the writing. And there's certain things that I, that I definitely you know, wanted to avoid. So I probably like, lost your question completely. But um, <laughs> No. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, the, I mean, I we're going to run out of time. I don't know how much time we have uh, because we want to open it up to questions at some point too. But um, I, I mean, I wanted to say that as a reader, the that incommensurability or there there are there's a way that you can know the work. The work is there, you keep coming back to it. The work is still alive. The artist is dead and gone. Um, and there are so many things that you can't know about the life. You really can't know what someone else, uh, what someone else's life is. So the difference between those two, because you keep going back to the, if you just take the parts of the book where you're talking about the work, what the work is, how it's working, what your response to it is, that's, that's a whole thing in itself. Um, and that's very convincing. Um, in talking about the life, it's difficult to be as convincing because it's so partial. It has to be so partial. I mean, as, as I told you, uh, for me, there was a break, kind of a breaking point in the book at, on page 130 where um, I came to this point where your quote, Dorothy Daner is talking about uh, an incident where she was, she and David Smith were walking behind um, uh, John Graham and uh, Eleanor Gibson and they were arguing and suddenly John Graham hits Eleanor and then starts beating the hell out of her and uh, David Smith and, and Dorothy Daner jumps in to stop him, to stop it and Smith grabs her and forcibly pulls her back and says we shouldn't get involved. That changed everything for me, and from that point on, I was sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop. I mean, it changed, you know, it changed my whole uh, view of, of Smith. Um, uh, and then later on, the, the, there are other incidents. Uh, he, he beats Daner, uh, she leaves, and... Um, the psychiatrist Bernard Gluck, who Smith respected, told Daner in 1950, you know you have to leave him or he'll kill you. So that, um, how is it that a man who spent his entire life and who's political, who politically was anti-authoritarian all the way, he was a man of the left, he was a socialist basically, um, how is it that he, uh, in his intimate relations with his two wives, uh, especially Dorothy Daner, was absolutely authoritarian? I mean, that talk about contradictions. Um, so the, the 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 John Graham incident. I mean, I tend to see there 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 is the event. And there's what came after, which is also that, that, that David Smith and Dorothy Dana remain very close to Eleanor Graham uh, and, and John Graham. For a while. Yeah, uh, Lee, and then they, were always, they were always close to Eleanor, and their, their friendship wasn't affected. And then there's also you know, the context of that, which is, you, you, know, you kind of hate to see it, you know, say it's another time, but it was another time, and David Smith was around 25 years old, and John Graham was probably double his age, and, uh, and was a tremendous um, figure for him. And in, in terms of helping his work, he introduced uh, David Smith to what was going on in, in Paris. You know, was a, I mean, he, he, he was kind of the most indispensable friend and you have someone who's a young man just sort of starting out. So what I, what I feel if you talk about like irreconcilability, uh, and I'm not sure I feel it so much there, but so I, I've got the event and I think about it, but there are also multiple contexts for it, for me. 
and, uh, and, and there are ways in which I can at least like, understand um, that the behavior, so that that alone, you know, and I certainly understand your response, uh, the sh it doesn't shock me, you know, that much. I think, but I, I think the, you know, what you're talking about with 1950, and, and this is, you know, really interesting. I mean, the challenge of writing the year 1950, because it was a momentous year for him. Um, I, start off, I start off the chapter by saying that that, that that was the year in which the relationship between Dorothy Daner and David Smith finally imploded. And, um, and the whole I, first part of the book is really centered on Daner and Smith. I mean, they were right. They had a good marriage. Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was a, a lot of vitality and closeness, and, and certainly it was like crucial to both of them. But yeah, I, I, what I wanted to say was that. So I start out by saying that this was this was the year in which the marriage imploded that in my opinion, the, the marriage was over, had already been over, had been over for a few years. That David Smith was in love with a much younger woman and uh, Jean Fries, and he knew that, that his, his work probably you know, depended upon um, the extension of that relationship. So that's, that's and, 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 and Dana too, in a way, needed, like when she left Smith, her work could take off. So they were stuck, they were stuck in, a, in a kind of bind. So what I'm saying about the irreconcilability, and this is, you know, it's difficult, is that I, 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 I hold the two of them together at the same time. One, that there are multiple contexts for that particular history, and two, he behaved the way he did. And, and the way he behaved is, is disturbing. And, uh, you know, I talk about it and, in, 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 you know, I, I, I talk about the kind of shock and brutality that he was capable of. But I feel like, and it's, one doesn't replace the other, it can't. So I feel for me they're, you know, they're both there, just like they're, they're, they're irreconcilables in the, in, in the work. There, there was a way he had always of putting things together that didn't belong together. Whether they were materials, you know, it's what he did a, as a cook where he would mix ingredients that nobody thought of mixing before and he would combine, try to make hybrid trees that, that didn't happen before and, and he would, you know, joke to the ladies about their cat and their dog you know, getting to, you know, uh, mating and creating a, a new kind of creature. So that's partly what I mean about the irreconcilable. I, I, for me, they're both there, and I think it's important that things have a context, mm -hmm. or multiple contexts. It, it's, and for me, I kind of, I understand it within those contexts, but on the other hand, you have a form of behavior that, that, that's not acceptable. And the two just exist together for me. And you know, it's partly what I was saying mm -hmm. earlier, there's a hole there and a totality. And then the fact that Dorothy Daner never stopped loving David Smith yeah. and, and, and supported him, you know, knew what a great artist he was and continued to support him until she died, that's important. Too, because she, you know, knew the value of the work and what he was bringing to the world. So we're talking about the totality here to me, and how do I, you, you know, how do you think about that, and how do you how do you gauge the various forms of behavior against someone who whose work is a gift to the world? and where the work is, is, is so generous and so generative that it really can't be exhausted. And I think you know, people feel, can feel that when they look at it here. So in, in terms of irreconcilability, I feel you know, talking about that particular year and beginning to get into the complexity of the year, it's not to explain anything, but it's to say there was a whole lot going on. And, uh, and to kind of ask people, 
to look to look or think about this totality. Mm. Where are we at? I think we're ready for questions and answers if if you're agreeable. Questions anyway, I don't know about answers. <laughs> well, thank you, first of all, a round of applause for that wonderful conversation. <laughs> And I'm going to pose the first question from one of our online audience members, which is, uh, Michael, in the book you mentioned Smith's antipathy to art criticism and art writers describing art, that he believed that art speaks for itself. And how did that affect your thoughts in writing your book on Smith? Can you repeat the first part of the question? Of course, yeah. Um, in the book, you mentioned Smith's antipathy to art criticism and um, writers describing art. And how did that? How did his ideas around that affect your your approaching him and his work? I think he had uh, his antipathy was not to all art writing; it was to certain kinds of art writing. Um, and he, again, he had this 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 hatred of explanation that that a, a lot of artists had. So what he didn't like was the kind of writing that would uh, reduce what it was that, um, that the critic was looking at. And you know, there were plenty of critics. I mean, he loved what Clement Greenberg wrote about him. There were you know, Gene Goosen, Hilton Kramer, Fairfield Porter, uh, Dory Ashton. Um, he was very supportive of people who were really supportive of him and, and um, was very good to them, actually. So the, it's not a question it, that the work sort of speaks for itself, but it is a question of how people write about it. And, and, uh, and he, was, he was interested in writings where people really took it on. Um, where there was a certain kind of risk in the writing, like there was a risk in the, in the making, and, and where they were willing to begin to follow the paths that Smith had created in making the work, where the, where the writing itself could be a kind of journey that was commensurate in some way with the journey that had gone into making the work. Thank you. Um, it, it occurred to me when you were showing the slides that um, some of the work looked rather totemic to me and reminded me of African art, which is not really, per se, you would say African art, but it's not created to be art. And that um, what you talked about, about the the essentially the spirituality of uh, Smith's work. It seems to me there's a kind of a correspondence between those things. Does that is that anything? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, you know, there were. I don't know if he if it was that the. I mean, the idea of art was very important to him. Obviously, but I, I, I'm not sure. There are plenty of I mean, there are plenty of other people who are really making art, and they know that they're making art. I think he was really involved, engaged with the process of working and 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 making things, and where a kind of necessity would really come out of this particular process that he had of working. And he definitely had ideas in the back of his mind about what, what, what sculpture had been, um, what sculpture could be, uh, what, what it needed to be in order to have a certain kind of impact on the world. And, uh, and there were connections. You know, he was part of a generation with, with, with Giacometti where the whole history of sculpture just opened up at a particular moment, and he was re really aware of that history. So, he had he had cave paintings in his in his mind, and that you know that sort of Australia there, that image of, of etched in space, etched in the sky. 
you know, has an image, has a sense to me of, of prehistoric art, and he was aware of, of Sumerian art and Egyptian art, you know, and he said at one point, I'm, I'm more Assyrian than, than Cubist. So it's, it's a, there, there's nothing precious about the work, and I think that to, to call attention to the spirituality is important. And uh, I think you, people can see it and, uh, you know, certainly see it in, in Australia and certainly see it in the way that, that the sky itself becomes part of the belly of the work, uh, is drawn into the work and the work becomes a magnet for, for some kind of, for forces around it that are bigger than the work. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if, if you know, what, could, what could give art a certain kind of purpose? What could make it necessary in the world? And those were questions that he was very aware of. And the answers to those questions came from art from all sorts of cultures. And I, and I, I don't know how important the notion of art was you know, when he was making it. I don't know how important the notion of uh, museum art was. I don't think like a lot of artists make art for museums. I don't think he was doing that. And I think the whole way that the art functioned outside on, in the landscape and the hills for him where they were, they were presences that, you know, that kept multiplying and existed in different relationships to one another, but also in relationships to the landscape, to the hills and the sky, and where there was a kind of conversation always going on with forces that were bigger than he was. And that's partly what I, when I refer to the generosity of the work and the generative force of the work, that's partly what I'm referring to. And you know, I should mention too that there are people like <clears throat> when Anthony Caro saw the work, when Ken Nolan saw the work for the first time, they didn't think it was art. Uh, like it had a kind of, it's very hard to actually, I mean, think about what Australia would have looked like in 1951. It's very hard to, to get back there in time, but it would have looked like something completely new that had erupted, you know, kind of out of nowhere and, and was really changing the idea of what, what art could be and what the relationship of the, of the viewer to the work of art could be. Thank you, Michael. I have another question from our online audience. Could you speak to how your research of Smith might push our seeing his work more deeply than it has been so far understood? <laughs> well, I would hope um, just by, by embedding the work into multiple contexts um, and making clear how important the work was to him, certainly, um, and it was his life, but to other people. I mean, there's a lot in the book about critical reception. I mean, it is a kind of history of critical reception as well. And when you read the, the it, it really, when you read what the work meant to critics and other people from the beginning, the way they wanted to be around it, and the way they wanted to talk about it, and the way they wanted to show it, um, so that the the various ways in which it, it 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 was everything to him, and it touched so many other people. And I think that in the course of the book, I mean, some of the critical responses to the work are remarkable, and they're remarkable to me even now. So I think. Um, I think they're just various levels of meaning, and I think if, if readers were to approach the book just in terms of the, of the critical context um, and how people wrote, I think that would immediately by itself deepen the way people think about it. Thank you. This is a much narrower question, but you mentioned cave art, and I've always been um, curious about the connection between the sprays and cave paintings, which were often sprayed. Um, so for those of us who have the book but haven't yet had a ch chance to dive in, I, I wanted to hear your thoughts about the sprays. 
Can you just say, when you said, you know, Alexi, when you talk about the connection between the sprays and cave, I do, I do kind of see what you're saying, but just asking well, for another sentence. You know, there's a lot of those hand imprints in mm -hmm. Altamira and the old caves, which are blo pigment blown across to create a negative image like the sprays. I, do, I wonder I mean, whether that was in his mind or maybe not. Well, he was certainly, you know, that generation was aware, I mean, the, the art of prehistory had come into people's awareness, not, was coming in and, and kind of exploded around the 30s and 40s. And, and they definitely had the sense that, you know, you know, for Smith, there was a, there was a family of artists. Uh, I mean, you know, de Kooning wrote about this directly too. It was a long family and it went back to the caves. And they, so they definitely had a sense that, um, that what happened at the beginning was as great as anything that had ever happened otherwise, you know, afterwards. So the idea of progress in art made no sense to them. You know, art could be used to help human progress, but art didn't itself progress. So I, you know, there, there's definitely his attachment to it and his awareness of it. I think in terms of the sprays, I, I think, just like I feel in Australia, there is a shamanic element to it, I think. I mean, just as I can see in some way in that image the notion of a garment, um, that, that somehow a sculpture can be something that you can wear, uh, you know, in you know, a figurative sense, and, and the energy that comes from beyond when you sort of bury yourself, even just visually, within that image that something pours over you and, and something transformative can happen. So, and I do see that in certain of, of the sprays as well, where they kind of look like bodies and look like bodies in which the, 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 the viewer can imagine himself, herself, themselves, uh, you know, Im embedding themselves in and, and something happening. And maybe in some ways the sprays for me, might embody that idea more clearly, some kind of shamanic idea than, than the sculpture. But also, you know, there there are stars, there are constellations, there are all sorts of other images in the, in the sprays, all of which are created by spraying over these very mundane, you know, sometimes almost rotten like household objects, right? So, so I think, I think you're hinting, like Claudia was hinting, at at what he was reaching for. Um, and I think in, in the sprays and that, that um, searching for some connection with a constellation of, of images that are part of the human but also beyond the human and somehow finding a way to integrate them, I do think that that's part of the sprays and I do you know, in, in that sense, and also in terms of actual images, think that, there, that there's some connection between the sprays and prehistory. It's a good point. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. I haven't read your book yet, so um, forgive me if this is covered in it, but I'm curious about your, you know, to hear your thoughts about, um, you know, sculpture per se, you, know, you refer to Gonzalez and Giacometti and you know, Picasso also, um, Brancusi, so there are these earlier figures overlapping also uh, with his time. And then you showed that great photograph with um, Pollock and Smith, and I'm just wondering, you know, I'm fascinated to read your book and, and, and see what you think about um, this era of painting, like great painting that was erupting in 1950 this year that you also cited. Um, and and, and I, I'm aware of Smith's work in other media, but I mean, I think he's primarily a sculptor and that's how we think of him. And so I'm just wondering like, it's a basic question, but like what made him a sculptor? Like why sculpture? What was, what was in that, all those contexts, what would be the thing that made him a sculptor or choose sculpture? Well, um, I mean, I kind of start if I'm gonna just like free associate with, with the, 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 phys the physicality of the person, um, the whole way in which he related to the world. 
and um, this, this enormous competence that he was someone who always liked to make things and he knew how to make things and he knew how to do things with his hands and he knew how to construct and build. So there's that side of it. And, and then uh, getting to the Studebaker factory in 1926 and, and, and seeing that, that it was possible to <clears throat> make sculpture in, in a way that felt completely contemporary by, by, um, by familiarizing himself and mastering that, the habits with which people you know, built automobiles and, <clears throat> and seeing that there was, a, there was a way of working then of course you know, it was completely triggered by Gonzales and, and seeing the, the, the work he did with Picasso that there, was a, that there was a way of working that was close to who he was and where he came from. I mean, Decatur was a town of inventors where people built automobiles in their backyards. Um, so that there was just a, 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 in which he saw that he could make things in a, in a way that was fresh and credible to him and who he was and his own history. And then, um, so I think, you know, on a basic level, uh, you know, that's, you know, that's there. And when he was in the Virgin Islands, he started to collect coral and just carve things. I mean, there's something, you know, in his nature about a physical relationship ma to materials and a way in, you know, that wanting to, <clears throat> to put his hands on materials and, 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 and work them and, and, and knowing that when they, it came through his hands, something could change, you know, that he would find himself in it but, uh, but the, there was some kind of fundamental possibility of transformation. So, and, and you know, then he, uh, you know, he, like you say, I mean, painting took off and it, it exploded, but, and I do talk about this in the book, the, 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 the competition between painting and sculpture and where it was part of his mission to bring sculpture up to the level of painting. And, and in, some, in some ways, I think maybe he even surpassed it. But this was, this was not something that was accidental. This was something that he thought about. And because uh, it was, a, it, was it, it had a, a secondary status and, and uh, you know, this affected him politi uh, you know, politically because there was a kind of condescension to, to it. It's still out there, frankly. Uh, and, uh, you know, and economically because people paid less for sculpture and he, and he was very aware how much more, paint, how much more money painters got. So you, you get into a, a long history of, of and, it, and it's, it's a great question of, of where it came from and how it developed and how he related to other sculptors and by and large the sculptors who interested him were, were painters. With the in the twentieth century, with the with the big exception being Brancusi. Hi, um, I have kind of a specific question. Um, so I was uh, watching a Q and A with the sculpture sculptor Rachel Harrison, right? And someone asked her um, whether or not Smith kind of was an influence uh, on her her work. And she responded by effectively saying that like, when she started making sculpture in the, I believe it would be like mid 90s or maybe it was early aughts, um, she didn't know who he was. And that was kind of shocking to me. And I didn't, so first there was kind of like shock, but then I was like, wait, no, like I shouldn't be cynical or like, you know, hypercritical because maybe I'm like missing something. Um, and so, I'm kind of curious about how Smith's public image has perhaps changed uh, or fluctuated um, over the past few decades, um, because I'm really trying to understand that and like how that could have happened. Um, yeah. <clears throat> wow, um, it's another like super question. I, I I think I mean I came back to New York from Paris in '82, and I think. When I came back, Smith was still regarded as, as the greatest American sculptor. <clears throat> and I think there was a kind of consensus about that. And, um, and then, bit by bit, the work started to, to fade uh, away. And 
And then, like the work that came after him, you know, and I'm thinking of, of a kind of point here with, with David Smith and Donald Judd, where Judd is a kind of, you know, modernist, postmodernist, tried to undo basically everything that Smith, you know, wanted to do. I mean, there's, there's no relationality in, in, in Judd's work. There's no, there's no hand, there's no, <clears throat> you know, there's, there's no association, there's kind of no story. And then, and that view of, of sculpture um, began to take over. And, and I think, and that, and I think by the, you know, 80s, 90s, sir, it, it was, it was completely um, embedded. And, and it's also possible that the reaction against um, Smith was determined to some degree by the association people had with Clement Greenberg and David Smith and, and the way in which that formalism fell completely out of favor. And, and one thing, you know, I, I hope people get out of the book too is just to see how problematic that identification of, of Smith with Greenberg is because uh, Greenberg was unquestionably really important to him his support for like 15 years, but in fundamental ways, David Smith went against, you know, everything that Clement Greenberg you know, believed in. So, um, and, and then it's like an interesting question why, like Smith made this work in the landscape. He made this work that was intended to speak to the elements, and it did, but in, when we think about land art, uh, we think, you know, we never, people never bring up David Smith. So why, and, and there are many ways in which his work continues into other histories. Uh, but the, but there's, a, there's a kind of break there. So uh, I, I think, you know, in part, Greenberg has something to do with it. I think in part, there's that like absolute break that, that Judd and a minimalist generation wanted to make, even though not, they wouldn't exist without David Smith. And you know, fundamentally, I think all of them really admired uh, David Smith. But I, I feel like the, you look at the work, and, and if you think about it in the contemporary, the, you know, there's, the, those sculptures are very performative. Uh, and his relation to the work has a certain performativity. Photography is very important to the work. Uh, you know, there's a way in which he was constantly mixing mediums together so that, so that the, the work should have a place in the in contemporary discourse, artistic discourse that it that it doesn't have. So I mean, that's my immediate reaction to your question. And I will also say about Rachel that um, the for the Guggenheim show in 2006, we had a contemporary art panel, and Rachel was on it, uh, and she was great. She was like the best, and. Um, and you know, I I I wonder if, if she would say more because I I, I I see elements of David Smith. I see she's speaking to a lot of people, and I see the presence of Smith um, in her work. But I went through that retrospective with her, and it was a great experience for me. And she had plenty to say. Like that work was close to her. So I'm, you know, in some ways. So I'm I'm interested in how she might continue that conversation. Anyway, your question's great. Thank you. I'm conscious of everyone's time. I think that's a really beautiful place to um, stop for this evening. Thank you both for this <laughs> exciting conversation. Thank you. Thank you.